Good afternoon. This uh, is the uh, first of sort of the speed dating sessions. It's supposed to be called Show Me the Future, but I think it's appropriate maybe Show Me the Money. Um, we uh, are delighted, I am delighted to be able to introduce uh, these two gentlemen and talk about uh, the transaction that their organizations did. Um, we've got Maurice Jones, who's the president and CEO of LISC on the end, and we've got Roy Swan, who's the managing director and co-head of Global Sustainable Finance at Morgan Stanley Bank. And if I were to go through their um, resumes and their accomplishments with any way to do them justice, we would not have any time at all for this panel, so I'm just gonna suffice it to say to read about it or Google them. They uh, both have worked in many aspects of, of the community development. Um, but I'd like to, to just get started and have them talk to us about the path-breaking $100 million private offering that was completed in April of this year. Um, this offering matched uh, one of the oldest and certainly one of the largest CDFIs in the country. Uh, LISC began in 1979 with a relative newcomer uh, to the CRA space. Morgan Stanley um, uh, Bank started in 2008, 2009. Um, and they together uh, created something really incredible. So I've asked Maurice to, to start off, give us an overview of how LIS came to, to even think about raising money on the capital markets, um, what their internal processes were, to think about why they needed this money, um, what they needed to do to get ready, and, and then how they chose Morgan. And then we've got some questions for Roy after that introduction. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon to everybody, and it's nice to be with you, nice to be with, with uh, Roy. Um, I think from our perspective, uh, hopefully I'm not, this is good, yeah? Yeah. Um, we, we had two or three big aspirations that sort of led us uh, to this journey. One was we, we needed capital that was more long-term than we were traditionally getting from our lenders. On average, our lenders were lending to us in three-year terms. Mm -hmm. We needed capital, or still need capital, to do work uh, in rural areas, to do work in the housing space, to do work in the small business space, and we needed capital that had uh, a longer term. Secondly, we needed capital that allowed us to work anywhere in the country, urban, rural, irrespective of whether uh, the lender was getting CRA credit for it or not, right? And so we needed geographically uninhibited capital. Uh, that led us to look for uh, a, a, an additional source of capital. We also um, wanted to take away the, um, the risk of uh, interest rates changing. We had variable interest rates in our loans, and we wanted to take out uh, some of those loans and have a fixed rate. And so looking for capital to do that with uh, was also um, part of our goal. So all of that led us to look for capital that was uh, different from what we um, had historically been relying on almost exclusively, not as a substitute, but to complement mm -hmm. what we were already doing. That's really what, at the end of the day, was behind what we were searching for. Or those were the problems we were trying to solve. And before you thought about this, what kind of um, changes did you need to do internally? I know that you got a rating from mm. S&P. Well, was that iterative after you got the RFP to, to have the, the partner? So we, um, we did seek a, a, a rating from um, S&P. And I believe we received that rating in September of the year before we ended up going to market. Uh, and we needed to do that, right? We needed to get a, a, a rating by a, um, a branded uh, rating agency. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we did that. And then the question was how you were gonna leverage that rating for the benefit uh, of the enterprise. And this made the, the most sense. So we segued from that to saying, okay, we need a partner, right? We need someone to help us 
do this work, to go out and leverage capital from the capital markets. And we had to decide whether we were going to attempt to do tax-exempt bonds versus uh, non-tax-exempt bonds. And I, initially, we thought we were going to try for tax-exempt uh, bonds. But we discovered that if we did tax-exempt bonds, we could only lend to not-for-profits. Uh -huh. And we work with for-profits and non-profits all over the country, so we didn't want that restriction. So we had to make that decision. And then we went out and we issued an RFP. Uh, we, wanted, uh, we, we wanted a competition for who would be our underwriter. And uh, far and away, Morgan Stanley came and we were looking for someone who would be aggressive in the marketing, someone who understood our business, someone, frankly, who was committed to diversity like we were. And uh, we went through a process and selected uh, uh, Roy and his team. And then we had to put together an even bigger team, which included auditors and lawyers. You can never exclude the lawyer, <laughs> right? Uh, oh, I see Michael Levine back there. I better be careful, my general, my general counsel sitting out in the audience. I love all lawyers, <laughs> just, just for the record. Um, and then went to work. Um, Fabulous. So it was a journey. It was probably, um, it was five or six months to go through, and this is post getting the rating, before we close. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it's all about having a high functioning team, and at the end of the day, that's what we put together. So, Roy, when your team got the RFP, did you think this is crazy? I mean, that this CDFI is going out to get this? Or did you think, wait, we've got capital markets experience and we can bring that to the bank? Help us understand internally what you thought about it. Did it come into your mind? Um, what are the regulators going to think of that? That was just the panel that we had. And uh, you know, how did, how did you help prepare to get them ready to go and, and to bring this to market? Well, first, um, before I respond, I want to thank uh, Buzz for uh, having me here. I'm very excited uh, to be with this August group um, and our esteemed colleagues here. Uh, I'm also excited, I have to admit, because um, tomorrow I go uh, to Parents' Day at my daughter's college. She's at Wesleyan, and I'm a rookie at this. She's a freshman. And um, so my wife and I will go up there and we'll start running around her ankles yeah, like that's what my little, wife went to school. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a, don't that's wear a good that sign. embarrassing sweater. Um, that, uh, <laughs> yeah, don't so, wear the sweater. So my colleagues Wendy and Joan are probably saying, Roy, didn't you just see your daughter two weeks ago? <laughs> yes, but uh, I'm still a rookie at this. But so um, the the one thing we would have advised Lisk not to do was to have an RFP, we would have liked to have been hired outright. <laughs> um, but um, I think you did say that. Yeah, we, <laughs> but um, to, to answer your question, our, from our perspective, it was almost a, it's finally here, not quite a what took you so long, because there were steps being taken before the financial crisis by CDFIs to start looking at diversifying uh, their, 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 their investor base um, and kind of fell apart in the financial crisis. And I started at Morgan Stanley the first, within 12 hours of Morgan Stanley becoming a bank holding company mm. on the quick. corporate treasury floor <laughs> and understood from that experience how important it is to have a diverse uh, universe of investors because what happened during a financial crisis was the search for liquidity. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what LISC has done is uh, they've diversified uh, the investor base, which I think is a great thing to do from, for, from a long-term perspective. But I think what Maurice covered in his comments uh, is sort of the way we, we think about it, and that is, what, you know, first you start with, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? And from a capital perspective, as you think about what your issues are um, and come up with all your, your sort of parameters around the problem, you then go out and you talk with your trusted financial advisors. And you know, we are uh, one of those to LISC, um, and, but it doesn't need to be exclusive because at the end of the day, Morgan Stanley wants all our partners in the community development field to be strong. And, uh, 
have um, great futures ahead of them and thrive. So we want to be a part of the problem solving, regardless of whether we actually uh, win a transaction. We do think we uh, happen to be the best investment bank for all our partners. Um, uh, but from our perspective, it was a matter of trying to help solve a problem and for LISC to then determine, you know, do we have what it takes to solve the If this is the path to the solution, do we have what it takes? And you have to have the right team. You know, you, you got Michael, Christine, uh, they've got a strong team of people. You have to be willing to dedicate the resources, uh, both from a time and from an expense perspective. And ultimately, in sort of today's capital markets environment, it's, it's all about coming up with solutions that often require collaborations among your financial advisors. Um, so that, I'll, I'll pause there because I'm not sure if I... Uh, That's great. Yeah. Uh, so Morgan acted as both the underwriter and the marketer for these. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, and that, did you... Um, were the people that ultimately bought these various tranches who you thought would buy them? Or was it... Uh, Tell me about that. Tell me about how you marketed and whether the, the people that you thought would buy are actually the ones that did, or did you find new participants in the market? Well, um, we, I guess the striking thing about, from our perspective was that there is this burgeoning impact investor universe, um, but it is just that it's burgeoning. It's not fully sort of mature at the moment. Um, in the discussions we had with a lot of the investors, that was sort of a nice um, sort of feather in the cap. At the, in the end, it was, you know, what does a credit look like? And um, fortunately, you know, LISC had what it took to get the AA rating at both the issuer and the, the actual issuance uh, from those, those perspectives. One of the things that was necessary and is necessary in any IPO uh, is a significant amount of potential investor education. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a, a very, um, I'm sure, tedious process. I see Christine nodding her head in uh, recollection of that <laughs> process. Um, and uh, not, but not only was it an, a, a name IPO, it was a sector IPO. So no one knew what the heck a CDFI was. Mm -hmm. and, but now they do. And Morgan Stanley had a uh, very robust marketing uh, process. And, and it kind of, one of the things about this whole process, which I do want to mention, is um, it, it is, it, it, depending upon what it was, and I want to make one correction, it was a public bond issuance, not a private issuance. Public. Um, and one of the things that's helpful, and I think is Morgan one of Morgan Stanley's competitive advantages, is we don't have silos between our CRA coverage team um, that is, Wendy, Joan, and I are in constant dialogue with our uni desk, uh, which ends up doing the transaction execution. And our coverage team spends, we know that we're the intern, we're the advocate for, for our client, making sure that the work of our execution side is getting done in a, in a, um, in a stellar way. Um, and in fact, I think LISC liked our coverage efforts so much. How much did you like our coverage efforts? Uh, this much, man, this and, much. And, and, it, and it culminated in, did, did we lose? Was, was one of our, is that, can we talk about that? <laughs> if you said, then I won't get in trouble. <laughs> um, no, you're good. We, we, um, we, are, we are honored to say that our, our lead coverage person um, on the transaction has become a member of the LISC team. There's no <laughs> higher honor um, that we could sort of experience. And Roy's still talking to me. So well, no, we no. This is this is this is real. We our goal is to help our, our clients, and I think a part of the reason why, a trend, and for others who are considering it, it's it's having a great relationship with your bankers, and it's all it's a people business. So I, I should be quiet. It's good stuff. Maurice, would you do it again? And if you did it again, what would you do differently? We would definitely do it. it uh, let me rephrase that. We will definitely do it yeah. again. Okay. Um, we think that we have to continue to diversify our sources of capital. 
Um, and this is for us not a substitute for capital that we are continuing to get from our uh, particularly traditional banking partners, uh, but it's a great complement uh, to that, and we are going to need that to do the work that, um, that we are trying to do. I will just build on uh, something that uh, Roy just said. The marketing piece of this was for us probably the most instructive component. Uh, look, we assumed that, or I assumed, that most of the investors would be folks who are actually currently investing in us, right? Um, but lo and behold, um, what, what I sort of underestimated was that the folks who are doing the capital markets work in these financial institutions in particular are different from the folks who actually have a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. And the two are not necessarily equally informed about us, and that's a con way of saying it. Um, and so um, we talked to, what surprised me was none of our current, we, these were all new investors. Fantastic. Um, and the primary reason is because our existing investors uh, had to go to a different part of their institutions to talk about this, and those folks just weren't schooled about who we were. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, I, I, um, I underestimated that fact. And so, um, to Morgan Stanley's credit, the marketing piece was certainly amongst their most brilliant work on this, because that's what really was the big job to be done. Uh, this was a new asset class and a new enterprise that folks had to wrap their arms around and people were like, well, wait a minute, they're going to take our debt capital and lend with it? How does that work? Um, so it was, uh, but we would do it again uh, and we plan to do it again. And maybe go for a longer, uh, longer time? Well, it's I interesting. I mean, I know that your longest tranche is 20 years? We, yeah, I think we, we did 5, 10, and 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and we could have done 30. Mm -hmm. The truth is, we don't have great demand for 30-year debt right now. Okay. Um, but um, I would anticipate us certainly looking at that again. And Roy, and then we're going to open it up to questions once all my uh, burning questions get answered. But Roy, when you look into your crystal ball and think, okay, this was the first one. There have been a couple other CDFIs who have done this. Maybe it's becoming less of a, a less of a story two or three or four years from now. Do you feel like all things being held equal, that pricing will uh, improve with, with a couple of things? One, with it being more of a known entity class, I think, as you put it, CDFIs. And do you think that there's the possibility that there will be a, an evolution of a secondary market so that, this, that the pricing could compress even further? Do you feel like those maybe aren't, aren't so critical? Well, um, I think generally um, pricing is supply-demand curve driven. And because the LISC bond was oversubscribed, um, I think it's fair to say uh, the pricing was, um, was, was, was solid pricing. With respect to liquidity, the question I would have is to what end? What, what, is the, what is the purpose, what type of liquidity you're talking about, what's the purpose of liquidity? Pricing generally in the capital markets is driven by um, credit and relative value. So portfolio managers are looking at different, different players typically in the same industry um, and how do they compare to one another. The great thing about having a couple of CDFI issues is each successive issue all other things being equal will be easier. Mm -hmm. And so finally, to the extent that marketing efforts um, result in a greater knowledge among the general universe of, of investors, there will be more supply, uh, excuse me, more demand in that supply demand curve. And as you get flows of capital rushing, gushing in, and this, could, this happens at the emerging market, you know, so VC, I mean, what we've seen in venture capital crashes and technology or internet or whatever it is, 
a rush of capital that could result in pricing that is driven more by supply demand curves than, than, tr than true value, right? Um, and sort of the supply, and, and so the supply demand is driven by a number of factors that aren't always based on fundamentals. Um, and so there's a kind of a volatility uh, on, on pricing. I mean, one of the things that, that Morgan Stanley is uh, good at and, and is um, in the CRA world is understanding the difference between perceived risk and actual risk. And um, there's sometimes arbitrage in those. And to the extent that more and more CDFIs go public, there will be less and less arbitrage because there will be more information. And people will realize to the extent that the CDFI industry may appear to some to be risky, as time goes on, they'll realize, well, there was a lot of perceived risk, the actual risk is lower, so whoever bought when the perceived risk was higher is going to gain from that. Mm. Questions in the audience? It's hard for me to see here. There's one right oh, here. There we go. It was a blended 4.35%. Uh, and the different tranches had a different price, and Christina can school me. I think the, the five, is that right? What was the, the, the cheapest tranche was the five-year tranche? Yeah. That was like three and a half? Exactly. Yeah. Three, yeah, 3.005. 3. It strikes me that having CDFIs access this kind of capital might push us more towards consolidation in CDFIs because arguably there are a lot of weak players out there. Do you have any thought about that? Um, it is an interesting question. Um, again, I think you have to think about the problem you're trying to solve, right? And so um, this is not a journey that right now is relevant for all CDFIs. Um, because just going through and getting your portfolio rated itself uh, I had an afro when I started yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, why did y'all laugh so much? <laughs> um, so it is possible that, you know, if this becomes the, um, the thing that the industry decides that uh, it, it should be pursuing in Moss, then consolidation would have to be one of the strategies to think about. But I would say for now, if anybody asks me, I, I would, truth in advertising, um, there is, you, you make sure that the problem you're trying to solve matches what the journey requires. Mr. Espinosa? Roy. Um, ah, Tom. Maurice. How are you doing, my friend? Good, good. Good to see you. Are you <laughs> hiding out over there? <laughs> I'm going to try to stay low key, this, right? This is one of my bosses here. I hope I didn't, I didn't say anything derogatory about the board. No, 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 no. It's all good. Roy, first question for you and then for Maurice. The first question, what size issuance do you have to have to make it really work for the CDFI? Uh, for a public bond issuance, $100 million is probably about the floor. And uh, I would say the kind of the true floor um, that most, that many would say is 250. But, but for um, a certain set of clients, um, 100 will work. And I'll add to that, there could be solutions for um, smaller CDFIs to kind of form a, um, kind of consolidate from a issuance perspective with some structure that would be of the size that would be interesting to investors. Mm -hmm. okay. Then Maurice, uh, the challenge for all of us, I, I think you'll, I know the work you do, so I'm not even worried about the, the response, but how's the tension on that type of capital to mission about what LISC is all about in the, in the marketplace that we serve? You said the tension? Yeah, if any. Uh, this, we need more of this type of capital do our work is the truth, right? We need more long-term, patient, geographically unrestricted capital to do our work. Um, uh, it is being both demanded by customers who are 
that we've been currently playing with. I saw some data, and if you can, you can look at post-recession and, and pre-recession, and the demand for longer-term capital uh, is really clear as a trend post-recession. For us, there's 71 million people in America living in rural America. Well, we want to serve them too. That's 22% of the country. We need tools that enable us to serve them just as aggressively as anybody in any urban area around. And so that's, you know, that's really why this was an appealing um, journey for us to pursue. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm getting the hook oh, symbol. The hook so uh, thanks to my panelists. I appreciate it thanks very for much. Us. And I'm it. delighted to have you here today. Thanks. Thanks.